Welcome back to Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. I am Bill Farmer. We're going to continue on the topic of predicate logic today, and we're going to talk about Genson style proof systems. Uh, last time we talked about Hilbert style proof systems, and we'll see Genson style proof systems are quite a bit different. Now, Genson uh, is a very famous mathematician and logician. In many ways, people might call him the father of proof theory, one of the major areas of logic. Um, Genson, as you can see, died in 1945. Uh, he was a supporter, apparently, of the Nazi regime in Germany, and he was captured by the Soviets and he was put in prison, and he died of starvation in that prison in 1945. Um, Genson developed a series of proof systems, and these proof systems uh, all have two rules of inference for each logical connective, which is a Boolean operator or quantifier. And the deduction theorem, which we saw was very important for being able to uh, argue that Hilbert style proofs actually exist, the deduction theorem is built in. And these proof systems fall in two kinds, natural deduction systems and sequence systems. They're closely related to each other, but we're going to focus on sequence systems. The important thing about Genson style proof systems is they are much more natural and practical than Hilbert style proof systems, but they also tend to be more complicated. Okay, so we're going to talk about sequence systems. And in order to talk about these, we need to know what a sequence is. So a sequence is here just a pair. It's just a pair of two formulas. Or I should say it's an ordered pair of two lists of formulas. So here's one list. Here's the other list. And these are, of course, finite lists. They could be empty. And we call the first list the antecedent and the second list the succeeding of the sequence. And instead of writing, um, actually, I, I said ordered pair. I should have round brackets around this. Instead of uh, writing a sequence as an ordered pair, we'll write it like this with the provability symbol in between. And in order to know what this means, is we'll say if we have a model of our of sigma, our, our signature, and we have a variable assignment, the, the value of the sequence here will be the same as the value of this implication. And so notice that the formulas in the antecedent, antecedent, we will treat as a conjunction, and the formulas in the succeedent, succeedent we treat as a disjunction. Uh, so having sequence is just a way of saying we have an implication, and we picked out uh, what the implication, the two different sides to the implication. Okay, so here's a sequence style system for FOL. And um, we'll have logical axioms and rules of inference. And the first thing you'll notice is that we have just one logical axiom, basically. Any sequence of this form where U and V contain a common formula. And then we have a bunch of rules of inference. So in a it's sort of opposite of a Hilbert style system in the sense that a Hilbert style system had a lot of axioms, only two rules of inference. And this Genson style system, it has one basic kind of axiom, a whole bunch of rules of inference. Now notice that we have a rule of inference for two rules of inference for each connective. So we have conjunction left, conjunction right, uh, Disjunction left, disjunction right, implication left, implication right, negation left, negation right. Uh, and on the next slide, we'll have the quantifier rules, but we'll get to those at, in a moment. So let's 
take a look at one of these rules. Let's take um, negation left. So negation left says, uh, so think of u, v, and w as lists of formulas and a, b, and a and b are just individual formulas. So if we have a formula here and a list of formulas, we can move this formula in, into the midst of this, in between these two lists, if we put a negation sign in front of it. And we have a similar rule that if we have a formula that's in front of the left-hand side, we can move it in the middle of the right-hand side with the negation sign. Uh, so that's one example. Here's an, another example. Let's, let's take implication right. If, if we have as part of our succeeding an implication, we can move the first part of that to the beginning of the left side and the second part of that to the beginning of the right side. And let's look at implication left. Implication left, we have an implication on the left. We can, we can move um, A to the right hand, the beginning of the right hand side, and we can move B to the beginning of the left hand side. And we actually, in this case, have two premises. So, so notice I was talking about going in this direction. Um, so normally we think of rules of inference as going in the opposite direction, going in this direction. We think if this is, if this is valid in a model, then this will be valid in a model. But these rules, we can go either direction, and it's convenient to go backwards because going backwards will suggest what we should do next. And so basically we we develop proofs by going backwards. And it's usually easier to understand and explain the rules if we think of these rules as going backwards. Because like I said, these, these rules have the property that if the premises are valid in a model, then the conclusion is valid in a model. And if the conclusion is valid in a model, then the premises are valid in a model. Usually a rule of inference has truth flowing only in this direction, only from the premises to the conclusion and not vice versa. Uh, but, in, but for this is, Genson style system, it uh, goes both ways. Okay, so maybe we can look at, well, let, let's look at this rule. This is disjunction right. So remember, the things on the right, their meaning is a, is a big disjunction. So if we have one of these formulas of disjunction, we can just take out that disjunction sign and write a comma b. Because, uh, like I said, v is a, you can think of it as a list of formulas that we think is a disjunction, same way with w. So we can think of this whole list as a list of disjunctions. And if we have disjunction on this side, we basically get a rule like proof by cases. So if we have a premise, which on the left-hand side, a member of our succeeding, uh, we can put A on the left-hand side and now give us a new premise. And we can put B also on the left-hand side. So basically, we're saying if we can show that W follows when we use A, and W follows when we use B, then W follows when we use A or B. Okay, so I'll let you look at the rest of those rules on your own. Um, let's go to the quantifier rules. Now these rules, these rules are uh, a bit more complicated because they involve variables. And we have, uh, for all left, and for all right, and then we have existential left and existential right, uh, and these are duals. So we can just talk about uh, for all left and for all right. And down here we have some conditions. Uh, so for all left, uh, uh, x here can be any variable, that's this condition, and t must be a term that's free for x and a. In other words, we can substitute t for x and a, and we won't get any variable 
assignment. So again, if we think of going this way, what this is saying is if, if we are assuming that for all x a is true, we can just as well assume in addition that every inst instance of a is true, where the instance is obtained by substituting t for x and a as long as we don't have variable captures. Uh, so so this, this corresponds to the rule we've mentioned before, universal instantiation. Now, uh, for all right is, is different. Here we have a y, and y is any variable such that y is free for x in a, uh, y is either x or not free in a, and y is not free in u, v, and w. So, so y is not free here. y does not occur in these parts. And, uh, and y is not free in A. So, so basically what, what we're doing is we're taking occurrences of x and we're replacing those occurrences with y. And as long as number 2 is satisfied, then we can, then we can conclude this. And this is, this is what people call universal generalization. It corresponds to the rule for Hilbert style systems that we had up here, which I call gen. Actually, it, it's gen with premises. It corresponds to this rule. I guess we were here. Um, and so it's critical that when we use this rule, when we introduce y, we have to satisfy these requirements, and in particular, y cannot be free in u, v, and w. OK, so, so with these rules, we can form deduction trees. And these deduction trees are just trees that have nodes labeled by sequence. And the conclusion of a deduction tree is whatever sequence labels a root. So a deduction tree, you know, is going to look like this. We have nodes. You know, it's going to look something like this. And we have nodes at all these points. And these, everything fits together according to those rules. And a deduction tree will be a proof tree if we have axioms here. So an axiom, remember, is any sequence where the left-hand side and the right-hand side have a common formula. And we'll say a sequence is provable in our proof system G, which we write like this. And unfortunately, we're using this proof symbol twice, but we're using it a different way. Um, but this is, it's customary to use in both ways. Anyway, we'll say that we can prove in G the sequent if there is a proof tree whose conclusion is a sequent. Okay, so now I have some examples of proofs. And remember, the way that construct a proof in G is a, is a go backwards. Start with what we want to prove. So say we wanted to prove A implies B. That would be a case where we have A implies B on the right-hand side. We don't have any assumptions or premises on the left-hand side. And then it says here, what we want to use is implication right. Let's go back and review what implication right said. Implication right said we can go to a new sequence where this A goes on the left-hand side, B goes in the beginning of the right-hand side. So let's say I do that. And I get A proves A. And this is an axiom because it has both sides have a common, common um, for, formula. So you can see proving A implies A is really trivial. Let me just remind you, it was not so easy to prove this in the Hilbert style system. Here's the proof. And if you start here, it's not at all obvious how you actually develop this proof. You know, it takes some thinking and trial error. While here, 
there's nothing to do. I just, I use the only rule I can use. Implication right. Okay, so here's another proof. We're going to prove that A implies double negation A. So the way I do this is I use implication right, just like I use that. And I move this A to the left-hand side, leave this on the right-hand side. So I get this. I get this here. And now what I do, I use negation right, and I move this formula to the left, and I take off one negation sign. So I get this. So I have negation A and A uh, proves nothing. And then I use negation left, and I move this to the right and take off the negation sign. And I get this. And this, again, is a logical axiom. OK, so let's do another proof. Uh, this is a proof that negation of A or B implies not A and not B. So this is an instance of the De Morgan laws. The Morgan laws, remember, is when you push a negation into a disjunction or a conjunction, you get, uh, if you have a disjunction, you're going to get a conjunction of the ne these negated formulas, or if you had a conjunction, you're going to get a disjunction of the negated form. So basically, you push the negation in, and you flip ors to ands, ands to ors. Okay, so we're going to use implication right. That moves this that moves this formula here to the left-hand side. Then we're going to use negation left. Negation left is going to move this to the right-hand side and take away the negation sign. Then we're going to use or uh, right, which basically takes a disjunction and turns it into two formulas. And then we're going to use uh, conjunction right. And so conjunction right means I form uh, I get two premises, uh, one with the uh, one with negation a, and one with negation b. And then I use for this part, I used uh, negation right. I move a to the left hand side, and now I have a appearing on both sides. I'm done. Here I move uh, negation b to the left-hand side, take away the negation side, and I have B and B. So that completes the proof. OK, so here's a couple more proofs. These proofs involve quantifiers. Uh, so the first one is I'm going to use uh, implication right. So I move this over to the left-hand side. And now what I want to do is for all left. And basically, for all left says, I can instantiate A with, with any term that I want. So I'm actually going to instantiate A, which means replace the, term, the variable x with any term I want, as long as we don't have a variable capture. I'm going to replace x with x. So that's just going to give me A. And so that's uh, for all left. For, for some right, what I do is um, um, wait I, um, for some right what I'm going to do is uh, I can replace again uh, I can put any instance here uh, and I'm going to take an instance where we replace x with x, and we get this. And once we do that, we see we have a in both sides, and we have a proof. OK, one more. Um, this is, uh, this shows, this is part of the, one of the formulas that shows uh, for some and for all are duals of each other. Um, or another way of saying it, if I pushed negation in here and flipped this and made this negated, that would be exactly what I have here. So we're going to use implication right. So we move this to the left, and then we're going to use negation left. So I move this over to the right and take away the negation sign. 
And now I can, I have two choices here. I can use for all right or uh, for some left. We really have to do for all right first. Because when I do for all right, I can replace the variable x with a variable y as long as that variable is does not occur or is not free, I should say, in the other formulas. Well, if I was going to replace it with some y, I wouldn't know if it's free in x or not, in a or not. But I do know that x is not free in here. So I'm going to take the instance of a where x goes x, and I will get this. So basically, I strip this off, keep the x, and I get this. And now I can do existential right, where there I, I no longer have that requirement that the instance must not be free in here. So I can replace x with x and get this. And then I do uh, negation right. I move the a to the front, take off the negation sign, and we have two of them, and we've completed our proof. Now, the thing to notice is that all of these proofs work in a way where I can start, um, and, I, and basically I can keep going backwards. And if I don't have any quantifiers, it's completely straightforward. I will always find a proof, or I'll find out that there is no proof. If I have quantifiers, it can be more complicated. And the reason for that is because I may have to do several instantiations. So let me go back up and look at one of these rules. If we look at um, this rule here, you see I can instantiate A and get this instance right here. But notice I keep for all X A, which means I can do many instantiations. So, um, and, it, and it may not be clear which instantiations you need to do. So for um, uh, proving formulas that involve quantifiers, it can be, uh, it can be uh, not completely obvious how to unfold your proof, but for propositional logic, it's completely obvious, and you're always going to come up with a proof when your formula is valid, and you're going to come up with, and you're going to discover when your proof is, when your formula is not valid, because the proof will fail. Okay, we're going to stop here, and I will um, uh, see you next time, and next time will be our last video on this topic.